Um, tonight we're going to be in chapter 9 of Hebrews, and we're going to be looking at the first 10 verses. We're going to be looking at the tabernacle. We're going to be looking at the, the articles inside the tabernacle and the significance of them. We're going to be looking at how Christ is being portrayed in the tabernacle. It's a, it's a picture, um, a typology of Jesus Christ. So let's, uh, let's pray and uh, ask God to, to take this time for us as we get into his word. <clears throat> and Lord, it's so good to be in your presence. Lord, we've been in the world's presence all day long. And Lord, we've been beat up and hammered and, and confused and um, Satan putting ideas in our head and, and going with some of those ideas and being in despair and depressed or whatever it might be. Lord, I just thank you that we can get away from all that. Father, we can have this time of sanctuary in you. Father, where you can build us up and Lord, you can send your spirit upon us to overflow us with your spirit, Lord, to encourage us, to strengthen us. Lord, to let us know that you love us, that you love us passionately. Lord, that you like us and you like spending time with us and you like being in the midst of us. And Lord, you like it that we're here down in downtown Oceanside. Lord, you like everything about this. Father, we thank you that you've guided, you've guided us and led us here um, to this facility. And Lord, that, you, that you're always going before us. Lord, we thank you. And Lord, even in the part of um, leading us into more worship. And Father, to, to see that there's a great need for us to worship you more. And as we worship you, that, we would, that you would make us worshipers. <laughs> and Lord, as we worship you, that, Father, you would commune with us. We invite you here yet again tonight, Father, to work in a mighty way, Lord, as we have been beat up from the world, and we're here to, to hear from you, and we're here to be transformed into the image of your Son. And Lord, that's the only reason we're here. We could do anything else at, at home, but we can't fellowship. We can't have communion like this anywhere else in the world. So, Father, we thank you for this night and look forward to what you may do with it. Be our teacher, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we're going to do something a little bit different even in the teaching tonight because it's a... Um, when, <clears throat> when we're going through some of these... Some of these... Um, some of these concepts... I think that we need some visual aids for that, and I think it'll help a little bit. And so um, as we go through each and every one of these verses, we're going to be looking at the tabernacle. I've got some pictures here that are drawings of the tabernacle, just so you can get a visual idea of what we're talking about. We don't do this often, but I think in, in the, the study of the tabernacle, it's essential, especially for those of us who are visual learners. You know, we... Like the, you know, when I when I look at books, I mean, they need to have pictures in them. You know, you know, I had a real hard time with my Bible because it didn't have any pictures. You know, so, so, yeah. <laughs> so, verse one, chapter nine of Hebrews. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and earth and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared. The first part in which there was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna. Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Well, we're going to try to speak in detail on, on some of these things. And first thing I wanted to, to bring up was in, um, in verse 1, it says, Indeed, even the first covenant. What was the first covenant? As we've been speaking on uh, on this, what was the what was the first covenant? The, law. the covenant of law, 
given on Mount Sinai? What was it? Uh, what was the um, the representation of of the the old covenant? What did we, yeah, stone. Yeah, the tablets of stone. But it says even the first covenant. Now, last week, if you were here with us, we went through chapter eight, and we were looking at the new covenant, this new arrangement, this new agreement that we have with God, where God is now changing our hearts, that He's doing our part and His part also. It's not based on our on our ability to keep the law, but our ability really to cry out to Him, cry out in our own inadequacy, in our own insufficiency, having Him change us from the inside out. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances or uh, regulations of divine service, which was worship and the earthly sanctuary. So sacrifices for sin to establish any type of relationship with God was done in the earthly sanctuary. And so we've got, yeah, if you want to show this, this what this what we're looking at here is is a picture of how the children of Israel were situated around the tabernacle. The tabernacle in the wilderness. The tabernacle was where the presence of God was. In the tabernacle, we've got we've got um, different things in the tabernacle like um, Maybe you can, Don, maybe you can show this around too. Um, the way that it was built, there was different skins, there was different materials, there was all these different um, articles making up the tabernacle, showing us the typology of Jesus Christ. Every one of the skins, every one of the colors, all has to do with Jesus Christ. As we're looking at these, as we're looking at these, these, um, at these articles, as we're looking at the tabernacle, keep in mind that it's the shadow of things to come. The shadow of things to come. The, it's, the substance is Christ, but everything in the Old Testament were just shadows and things that, 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 wasn't, that wasn't significant. But only pointing us to Jesus Christ. Always pointing us to Jesus Christ. When... Um, when you look at the tabernacle, you see that it was the visible presence of God. If, if you saw this, in this one picture here, you have, you have the tabernacle, and then you have this cloud above the tabernacle that's coming out. Okay, and what is that cloud? Yeah, it's a, what's that? Yeah, the cloud of the Lord. It's the... You know, as the children of Israel were led by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day, you know this is what this is where it ended up. It stopped, and that's where the tabernacle was erected, right there. And then when the when the cloud, and the, so the cloud would be there, and every time when the children of Israel would get up in the morning, see all the tents all the way around. Okay, their tents were all facing towards the tabernacle. So when they got up in the morning, when they went to bed at night, what was the first thing that they saw? They, they, saw, they saw the cloud because they had this little fence around the tabernacle so they wouldn't see a lot inside the tabernacle and the compound, but they would see the pillar of cloud. The presence of God was always there for them. Now, if they woke up in the morning and the cloud just kind of starts drifting, what did that mean? Yeah, it means, you know, let's pitch, you know, let's uh, take up our tents, you know, let's pack our bags, we're going. You know, wherever the Lord's going, we're going. And so it's the same way with us. You know, as we're being led by the Spirit, the same thing is happening. When the Spirit moves, we move. You know, when the Spirit tells us to do something, we do those things. Because, we, because He's speaking to our hearts, He's speaking to our minds. He's telling us what things to do. Okay? Um, let's see what else. Each one of these different um, groups of tents were the different tribes of Israel. Okay, and then there, then they had this. They don't have it in here, but they had banners, and each one of the banners would would tell which one of the tribes it, it was, and so all the tribes were all facing towards the presence of God. So how is that a type of Christ then? How would that work as a type of Christ? Well, in the same way that the presence of God. As you are a believer, as you ask Jesus into your life then you have the presence of God at all times. The presence of Christ is living in you. 
See, it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. In the Old Covenant, what, where was the Lord? It was in the cloud, away from you. It only showed that the Lord was there and they were here. And even though there was, it was a wonderful thing to wake up every morning and see the Lord, see the, the cloud of the Lord, it only reminded them of the fact that there was a separation. They couldn't have that presence because the only way you could have the presence of God was to do what? Yeah, you had to go into the Holy of Holies, didn't you? He had to go into the tabernacle. And who was able to go in the Holy of Holies? The high priest, how often? Once a year. Once a year, that was it. Okay, and so there was always that separation between man, sinful man, and holy God. Now, where, was, where were the laws given? On Mount Sinai. What was happening when the laws were given to Moses? What did the people down below see? Clouds, earthquakes thunder, lightning, you know, and if anyone would even touch the mountain of the Lord, what would happen? They died. What, if, what would happen if, a, if an animal touched the, the mountain of the Lord? They would die. And what was that showing? The holiness of God, the power of God, the might of God. And so all these things showing us the shadow of things to come, which is Jesus Christ. Then, indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and, earth, and the earthly sanctuary for the tabernacle was prepared. Now, before they got into the... Can you see this okay? Or... Can you see it okay? Maybe it's going to bring it a little bit closer. Anyway, what we have here, once you get into the tabernacle compound... Once you get into the tabernacle compound, then the first thing that you would come to is the brass, the brazen, the brazen altar. Thanks. This here. And so, and what are they doing on this? Yeah, they're having a barbecue, aren't they? <laughs> and so what they're doing, they're putting an animal there. They've, they've slit the animal's throat. It, it, either a lamb or, a, or an ox, and they put it on the altar, and then they burn it. And they burn it, and then the, the, the smoke that goes up is a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord. It was a sacrifice. It was the blood sacrifice of an animal that would cover their sins temporarily. How is that similar to... That was the shadow of things to come. What was the substance? Yeah, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth. One sacrifice for Jesus Christ. And so this sacrifice was made, and they had to make a sacrifice every morning, every evening. And the way that it would be done is that, you know, the person would bring in their animal, they'd bring in their, their goat or their ox, put their hands on it, the, then the high priest would, would pray over the person, they put their hands on it, their sins were transferred from them to that animal, the animal's throat was cut, the blood would flow. And then the sins were covered for a period of time. Now, the high priest, once a year, when they would go in to make sacrifices for, when they, on the Day of Atonement, when they'd go in to the Holy of Holies, the first thing that they would come to was this. And they would make an offering for their own sins. Because the high priest wasn't sinless. He had to make his own sacrifice. So he would make the sacrifice here. Then after that, he changed his clothes, and then here, here is a brazen altar, I mean, the brazen laver, you know, and they don't know exactly how big the, the, this uh, laver is. This is the only one that doesn't give any dimensions, but there's water in the top, and there's also water in the bottom. And so they'd wash their hands, and they'd wash their feet, so that they would be totally clean before they would go in to the tabernacle. All right? So he's got that. So first, make atonement for their sins. Then they'd be washed in the water. And what, is, what does the water symbolize for us? The water of the word. So it's like, so being bathed in the water of the word, speaking about the word of God, speaking sometimes of the Holy Spirit, uh, but, but speaking about how he couldn't go in, even to the tabernacle at all, without being washed, without having his sins atoned for. 
then after after he got there, then then this would be the first part he would go into. Okay. Now, as he would go in to this into the that first part of the sanctuary, it says that in verse two, for the tabernacle was prepared. The first part, as you enter, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary or the holy place. The sanctuary or holy place is that first cubicle that they come into. It's 30, feet, 30 cubits long, 30 cubits high, and, and, and 15 cubits high, and 15 cubits wide. Now, how, how big is a cubit? Yeah. Yeah, about 18 inches uh, from here to here, um, uh, two hand spans perhaps. You know, you've got um, this this section, so they they have estimated that's about 18 inches, so a little you know a little more than a foot or a foot and a half. Okay, so it's 30 by 15 by 15 cubits. Okay, as you come in, these are these are the things that you're going to see. Now, as you notice, when you first come into the tabernacle, you have to go. You had to go through that first veil. You had to go through that first door opening. And then, as you come into it, as you enter in, and the writer of Hebrews here is, is wanting us to know exactly what's happening inside the tabernacle. Wants us to know about the tabernacle. Why? Why is it important that we know about this? Isn't this this Old Testament junk? Yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this was all done as a shadow of the substance to come. If you know the shadows, you appreciate the substance even that much more, okay? Now, as we, as we look, we come in, and we see on the left, we see the golden lampstand. It has seven um, candles that are, not, they're not even candles. What, what this is is, is, is made from one piece of gold, and in the today's standard, it would be about $25,000 worth of gold. And they've, and they've put it together where they have these, these different arms coming out. Now, we don't know exactly what they look like, but we have a pretty good description. The, on the top here, they're, it's, they're um, engraved all, um, um, olive, almond, excuse me, almond leaves, and they're in a, in a bowl shape. And so they've engraved these almond, these almond leaves shaped bowls and each one of the bowls is given, um, is poured in olive oil. And, and then it's lit, and every day, and then there's a wick that goes in the middle. So every day, the, the priests come in, and they trim the wicks, they put more oil in, so it's a perpetual light here in the holy place, the first part, the tabernacle here. Now, what is that symbolizing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's speaking about it's speaking about that Jesus said that I am the light of the world. Okay, He is the light. Um, also, the, the these bowls had oil in it. The oil speaks of what? Speaks of the Holy Spirit. In Revelation chapter one, uh, in in Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. Uh, they have a they have an, a menorah. That's what this is. They have a menorah, and it's on the front on the counter. There's a um, there's a communion table, and then there's always a menorah there. And people have asked, you know, why do you have a menorah there? I mean, is this a Jewish thing or what? And the, you know, what Chuck says, and I think it's I think it's uh, very valid. He says that that the menorah is spoken of in Revelation chapter one, when when it talks about. In, in chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet, and girded about with a chest with a golden band, his head was like... His head and his hair were like, like white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice was the sound of many waters. Now, 
it also, now it, it goes on to tell us what these things are. It says that in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. Speaking about the mm -hmm. fact that Jesus is in the midst of the churches. Specifically, it was speaking about the seven churches of Asia Minor at this time, but it was a symbolic of Jesus being in the midst of the churches. And so the fact that, that we'd have a menorah or, or Calvary Costa Mesa or whoever would have a menorah only speaks of the fact that Jesus is in the midst of the church. Okay? He is the light of the world. The Holy Spirit is, is the oil. Uh, the sevenfold uh, work of the Holy Spirit is seen in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 11. Okay. Now, the next thing that we see, so the, on the left, we're going to see the golden lampstand. On the right, we're going to see the table of showbread. Okay, there's a table here, this gold table, and then there's, there's, um, there's uh, 12 loaves of bread. Now, this is probably not a good representation because they're stacked on top of each other because it talks about the showbread being in rows. And what it says that there's 12 cakes of fine flour, two rows of six each, and it has frankincense poured on each cake. And each Sabbath day, the loaves are given to the priest and they're replaced. So they're, they're, they stay for one week. Okay? And this is, this is made out of um, acacia wood, the table here, and gold, gold on the outlay. It's, this is probably bigger than what it really is because it's actually only two cubits long, one cubit wide, and one and a half cubits high. So how long is two cubits? Yeah, like a yard, one cubit wide, like a foot and a half, and then, a, and then one and a half high. Okay? So the table of showbread. And this, is, and this makes up the sanctuary, um, but we have one more thing in here that in the, in the Old Testament, in Leviticus and Exodus, we see that, that the, the altar of incense is in this holy place here. But then when we look here in, in Hebrews chapter 9, we see that, the, that this is on the other side of the veil. Interesting. It's a, it's a mystery. And there's a lot of commentators who try to figure it out, but they're not, they're not able to do that. Okay, so anyway, but we're looking at the, this is the altar of incense, and what we do with the altar of incense, there's coals on it, and then they take incense, and then they put the incense on top of the coals, and this, this makes this, uh, this big cloud, you know, that, and, and then the cloud represents the prayers of the saints, the prayers of those going up to the Lord, and he hears the prayers, he smells the prayers, they're, they're in his presence. This is, okay, on the, this is on the, um, this is the, uh, the veil between the, the holy place and the, and the um, holy of holies. And this is something that's embroidered on, on, the, the, um, on the veil itself. The veil that was ripped from top to bottom, you know, very similar to this. Okay. This is the tabernacle. The veil that was ripped from top to bottom was what? In what? It was in the temple. So it was a little bit different. Okay. But still, but you have cherubim you know, that are engraved. Actually, I think as you look at the real actual rendition of what this is really like, it was like there was a bunch of them, a bunch of cherubim that were, that were covered on this, on this one veil. Okay. In verse 3, and behind the second veil, and this, and this is the second veil. The first veil is when we came in. This is the second veil. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Now, this, this veil, this, this second veil, it's, it's called the, this is the curtain. This is, it's called the veil of testimony. Uh, it's also called, uh, it's made out of linen, uh, blue, purple, scarlet, and it's embroidered with cherubim. It was used to wrap the Ark of the Covenant when they move it. But what would, what would the veil represent? 
Yeah, it, it represents the separation that man had from God. See, the closest that even the priest could come to the presence of God was in the holy place, not the holy of holies. There was always that veil in the way, you know, that darn veil. You know, and I couldn't get to God because of the veil. Something had to happen to the veil. God had to do something with the veil. What did he do with it? He split it down. He opened it up. And so there's no longer that separation from man and God. Jesus had to do that. He had to do that work. He keeps it open. He keeps the veil open with his blood. His blood is outlining. It's like his blood is outlining the, the opening to the holiest of all. His blood is keeping it open for us. We have access now. Because of Jesus Christ, we have constant access to the holiest of all. Now, once you get in to the holiest of all, verse, verse 4, it says, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. <clears throat> now, the first thing that we see, that it had the golden censer. Does any of your translations have something different than golden censer? Golden yeah, golden altar. Golden altar of incense. Yeah. Anyway, this is, um, there is a, a controversy if this is actually called talking about the golden altar or it's talking about the golden censer. Now, what's a censer? Do you know what a censer is? Yeah. Yeah. It was something that had chains on it, and then there was a bulb there, and they'd put hot coals in it, and then they would put, they'd put incense on it, and then they'd kind of swing it. If you've been to a Catholic funeral, um, they, they, they use these, these uh, censers. And they go around the dead body, you know, with these things. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this is the censer. Um, either it was a censer or the actual, or the actual um, altar. It was inside the holiest of all, the holy of holies here. And this, and it speaks of, really, when you're when you're talking about the smoke that's coming up from the incense, from the incense, it's always speaking about intercession, the intercession that we're interceding, we're praying, but it's also speaking about Jesus' intercession for us. When we saw in, in um, let's see, a couple of weeks ago in, in, um, in uh, Hebrews 7.25, that he ever lives to make intercession for us. Our high priest, Jesus Christ, ever lives, lives always to make intercession for us. So this is speaking about that intercession, this, um, this, this cloud that goes up before the Lord. It's a sweet-smelling savor to him. And the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid on all sides with gold, which are, um, and they had these three different things in it. Now, the, the Ark of the Covenant, this is a um, one, one artist's rendition of what the Ark of the Covenant may look like. Um, they don't know. They don't really ha have um, um, a great idea. But we do know that there is two that the, the Ark of the Covenant was made out of gold. It had a lid on it that was called the mercy seat. And then there was two cherubim that were standing on both sides of the lid, on top of the lid. And the cherubim were looking together. They were looking towards each other, and their wings touched in the middle. Thanks. Now, the significance about this is that we, we could only see this. The children of Israel could never see this, but it was only seen once a year by the high priest on the Day of Atonement. He would go in there, and it was all lit up. There wasn't any light. There wasn't any, any natural lighting in there, or there wasn't any, um, you know, there was no windows, but it was lit up. Why was it lit up? The Shekinah glory. The glory of the Lord hung out in the holiest of all. That's where his presence was made known. And he, his presence was somewhere right in here, right in this whole area, above the mercy seat, which, which, which is the lid, and between the two cherubim, right here. Now, why is it significant that, that his presence would be in that particular place? Okay, above the mercy seat. Yeah, because Jesus is our propitiation. 
in the Hebrew, propitiation means mercy seat. So the mercy seat is the same thing as Jesus propitiating our sins or atoning for our sins or, or making good our sins, taking his sins on himself. And so right above here, above the mercy seat. Now, what's inside, what was inside the, the Ark of the Covenant? Okay, yeah, manna, Aaron's rod, and the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of stone. Now, the Old Covenant was inside the two tablets of stone. The law was inside the Ark of the Covenant. But then there was something on top of it. What was on top of it? The mercy seat. See, because we need mercy. You know, the law convicts us and condemns us to death, and we need mercy before the Lord. And so Jesus, as our mercy seat, he is, he is between sinful man, us, and the law, inside. See, he bridges the gap. He took our place. He became, he, Jesus said that I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill it. And that I came to fulfill it in you. I fulfilled it for you, in you, so that you didn't have to. So here is a representation of what he did you know, in the law. In Romans, <clears throat> what am I looking for? What's in Romans? <laughs> Five what? No? Okay, let's, it might come to me. Anyway. 512? No, I don't think so. Um, anyway, <laughs> good good guesses, you know. 815, 92, 105. Yeah. Anyway, it says it says in um, in Second Corinthians 521, it says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we may might become the righteousness of God in him. So he became sin for us. He became, and so he was able to take on, he became our righteousness. He took his righteous standards, his righteous, um, his righteousness took on the law and then gave us his righteousness for that. Um, Romans 8, verse 4, or actually verse 3. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through our flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. See, the law convicted us, the law condemned us, but what the law couldn't do, the law couldn't change us, couldn't give us life, could only condemn us, could be our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ, but couldn't make us holy. Verse 4 of chapter 8 of Romans, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, not by us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So, as we walk in the Spirit, then the law is taken care of. We are not under the law if we are walking by the Spirit because we're now guided by the Spirit. The Spirit is speaking to us. It's not the exterior, the external tablets of stone that we need to relate to. Now we relate to a person. We relate, we relate to the person of Jesus Christ as he's writing his laws on our hearts and on our minds. He's speaking to us individually, telling us those things that, we, that he wants us to do to please him, not only telling us what to do, but also causing, him, causing us to do those things, giving us the power of the Holy Spirit, because it's the power of the Holy Spirit that even enables us uh, to do those things that please him. It's God working in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Now, also, in, in the Ark of the Covenant, we, we see that there was the golden pot that had the manna. What does that speak of for us? God's provision, the manna, was God's provision in the wilderness? The bread of life. Jesus said that in the same way that Moses, when he said that Moses really didn't give manna, as God gave manna to the children of Israel, so I am that manna. I am the substance that you need. I am the, the sustainer of life. I am the bread of life. 
And so the manna, uh, speaking again of Jesus Christ. And then Aaron's rod that budded. And the, the budding of Aaron's rod validated the his priesthood, his Aaronic priesthood, and therefore, um, as we've been talking about, the priesthood of man and the priesthood of Jesus Christ after the order of Melchizedek, we see that Jesus is our is our greater high priest, better than better than that of, of um, Aaron. Okay. And above it, verse five, and above it were the cherubim of glory. And this is the divine presence of God, the glory of God. The wings are, are the protection over the, the seat, the mercy seat, and showing us that our sins are forgiven. It says that the, the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Or in, in Romans uh, 3.25, uh, that he that Jesus is our propitiation. Of these things we cannot now speak in in detail. Jesus is our our mercy seat, and uh, the mystery of the of the rent veil, the ripped veil. Now verse six, going on. Now when these things had had thus been prepared, the priests, the Levitical priests, always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services every morning and every evening. And so what was what was the first part into the first part of the tabernacle? What was that called? The sanctuary, the sanctuary, the, the holy place. So that's where the priest hung out. Every day they'd go in, every morning, every evening. What what would they do there? Well every day they trimmed the lamps. Every day that they they put um, they put in um, um, oil every day. They they put incense in the altar. And then weekly, they they baked new loaves of bread, and the loaves of bread were then given to the priests for them to eat. Yearly, they were they sprinkled blood on the mercy seat. You know, he'd go behind the high priest once a year. Would go behind, and then this is a. Uh, a picture where you would have the high priest and you'd have him sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat. Now, as as we look in a typology, the the outer court was a, was a place where where we would consider as Christians salvation. And so those who would come into the the temple compound you know, around the tabernacle, inside the inside the walls, that was the that was salvation. Now the holy place was different because you went into the holy place for service. And then the holy of holies was the actual presence of God. Speaking about it for us, personal application, you know, that when we become born again, we we end up we start off in that in that outer sanctuary. We're, sat, we're saved and we're blessed to be there. We're in this, enter into these courts with thanksgiving. And that's what we do. We've entered in. And we're thankful that we're saved. And we're just singing praises to the Lord. We're saved. We're going to heaven. Praise the Lord. He's pulled me out of the muck. He's put my feet on the rock. But what happens is so many Christians stay there. And they don't move on. They don't mature. You know, they, they go back to their old ways or they, or they dabble, they, they're double-minded or they have a divided heart and they live their, their whole life in really kind of a defeated state here in, this, in this, um, temp, this temple tabernacle compound. But then after that, after you go on from that, is going into the holy place, which is service, where the priests serve the Lord. And so that would be those Christians who not only are saved, but now they're in the body of Christ, they're serving. You know, they're they're actually being a, a functioning member of the body of Christ. You know, they're they're meeting other people's needs. They they would be considered um, the Marthas. You know, and and uh, the Marthas, as as Jesus would, um, you know, was when he was talking to Martha and Mary. Mary was the one that sat at his feet. Martha was the one that was doing the work. And the work is important. We need to have workers in the church. Absolutely. But then going on into the inner sanctuary, the holiest of all. This is where. God wants us to dwell. This is what? What would that be considered? 
What type of Christian would that be who's in the holy place? Sitting at his feet. Yeah. Yeah. Resting in his grace. Abiding in the Lord. What's that? Mastered by the Master. Communing with him. Having a relationship with him. Being able to hear his voice. Following him. Not grieving the spirit, not quenching the spirit, but, but just being a just being a vessel to saying, you know, God, you tell you know, you show me what you want. You know, I just want to be open to you and God, you change my heart as I commune with you, as as we have fellowship with one another, you write your laws on my heart, you write on my on my heart, on my mind, and Lord, you have that your way with me. I want to surrender my life totally to you. I am absolutely surrendered to you. And so that's what that in that holy place is. Now here, this, is, this would be interesting now. Can a Christian then, using the same typology, can they be in two places at once? Can they be in two places in the, in the, in the sanctuary? Can you be in the holy place and the holy of holies and the outer sanctuary? What's that? <laughs> Spiritually. Right. The grace of God is doing the work through him, so he's he's resting in God's work. Yeah, yeah. Because see, here here we have we have this example a lot of times, and you hear you know and you hear it taught, and it's a good it's a good example when when Mary is sitting at Jesus's feet and Martha is working. And so then so it's like so a Christian says, well, okay, well I'm not going to work, I'm just going to sit at Jesus's feet. And so the ones that are working, they say, well, gosh, you know, you're working and I'm, you know, I'm doing the best part here. Okay? But, see, the, the thing is, is that, that Jesus didn't say that, that Martha was doing wrong by working. He just said that, you know, that her heart was wrong because she was saying, Mary, how come you're not doing what I'm doing? See, I mean, it's right to work. You know, we need to be working. We need to be, you know, having the Lord work through us where we're doing things, but we're resting in him at the same time. See, so you can. I really believe you can be both places. You know, we need, we need Martha workers with Mary's hearts. You know? We need people who are in the Holy of Holies, but we're also in the Holy, holy place where we're, being, that we're, we're serving the Lord. We're serving one another. Because, you know, those Christians who only are, you know, who they say that they're in the Holy of Holies, they're communing with the Lord, I mean, if there's no fruit in their life, other than the fact that they're just spending time with the Lord, you know, then, you know, there's something missing. You know, there's something missing in the whole, in the, the big picture of, of what God is calling us to do. He wants us to be the light of the world. He wants us to bear fruit. He wants us to edify one another, to love one another, have unity with one another. And so if we're not spending time with people serving them, because Jesus said, you know, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you need to be a servant of all. You know, Jesus was a servant. He washed feet, dirty feet, smelly feet. <laughs> My hero. <Yeah. laughs> and so we also, you know, we need to be doing those things, but, but we're doing it as we're resting in him. You know, we're working as we're looking to him. You know? And we're letting his life live in us he, we're letting him motivate us, him change us from the inside out, and then going out to others to love them, to love your wives, to love your husbands, you know, to love your neighbors, to love your children, to love people at work, you know, to love the, the members of the body of Christ here at Living Hope. You know, this is what God's calling us to do. You know, this is the, the full program that God has for us, resting in him, but just being working, just like what Dave was saying, you know, when, when Paul said that, let me read it to you, in, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says that, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. So Paul was a worker. He worked hard. He labored. He was poured out. 
He felt like he was going to die. He had nothing left because he was being poured out constantly. But he says, but yet not I. I didn't do it, but it was the grace of God which was with me. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer me living, but it's Christ living in me, motivating me, changing me, finding people to love, loving through me, that I would be a conduit of his love. Verse 6 again, now, now these things, now when these things had thus been prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year into the holiest of all, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in in, in, in Ignorance. This word blood in the in the ninth chapter of Hebrews, I think it's used like twelve different times. Next week we're going to be talking about the blood. What is blood? What's all this blood and gut stuff? You know, why do we talk about blood? Why is it so important? What about the blood of Jesus? What you know, why is it blood? Well, we're going to speak a lot about that next week. But but um, just to suffice it to say that that he went in once a year, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the people's sin committed in ignorance. So what was who are we talking about right now? Who went in once a year? High priest. Where did he go? To the second part is the Holy of Holies. Okay, but not without blood. He had to have blood. Couldn't go in by himself. You go in by yourself, what was going to happen to him? Boom. Yeah, God would kill him. He says, you can't come in by yourself. you got to come in with something better than just you. you know? I know you. And so now when we come in, what about us? Can we come in without blood? Not without blood. We've got the blood of Jesus Christ. The only way that we can come in is because of the blood of Jesus. Verse 8. The Holy Spirit indicating this that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performs the service perfect in regard to conscience. See, this was a problem with the Old Covenant. Your conscience could never be cleared. It could never be covered. But in the New Covenant, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, we have a brand new relationship with God. No more condemnation, only his grace, his love, his covering of his, with his blood, concerning only the food and drinks, various washings and fleshy ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Now this isn't the great reformation with Martin Luther. This is this reformation, this change from the old covenant to the new covenant. The book of Hebrews is speaking always about this transition, this reformation from one system, one covenant, to the next. The blood of bulls and goats to the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, entering in one time a year to entering in continuously. That's what we can do right now. And we have run out of time. But uh, next week we'll continue this. Um, well, before, before we pray, um, this is, this is um, the, the, an artist representation of what all these articles that we covered would look like. It's in, a, it's in the form of a cross. We have the, the, um, the brazen altar, the brass laver. We have the, this, this here would be the altar of incense. We have the, the golden um, lampstand, the table of showbread, the Ark of the Covenant, all making a perfect cross. You know, and so as you look at the tabernacle, and, it, and if we had time, we could we could spend you know two months on just the tabernacle and, and the colors and the and the, the, the type of uh, the, the typology and the colors and also in the metals and the woods because it all has to do with Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful study. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for sh- Father showing us that that Jesus didn't come in a vacuum, but Lord, you had show you showed us over and over again uh, through the beginning of time that there was going to be a person, a mediator for us, that we would have relationship with you. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that because of his blood, we can go 
behind the veil anytime we want. Lord, that you are beckoning us, you're asking us and even pleading with us to come in to have fellowship with you. And Father, the only reason that we don't have it is because we don't ask. The only reason that we don't have intimacy with you is because we don't believe we can have it. So Father, let not our unbelief, let not our lack of faith keep us out of that relationship that you want with us personally. We're not talking about someone else's relationship with you. We're not talking about the church's relationship. But Lord, we're talking about us individually. You want to speak to us. You love us. It's not this that, you, that you love the world, but you love us. And you died for us personally, Lord. And we thank you for that, Lord. May we not grow short. May we not frustrate or grieve your spirit by not entering in all that you have for us, Lord. Open our hearts. Open our minds. Cause us to do those things that would please you, Lord. As we come boldly before your throne of grace and receive mercy for our sins and our failures and grace to help in our time of need, which is even right now. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Right now.